we are continuing on the same thing morphogenesis okay so today we are going to move closer towards um, cell cell signaling so before we get into actually the molecular pathway of cell cell signaling we need to look at some basic principles that govern um, you know the uh, the rules of interaction among cells so the basic things that's what we are going to look at today so in that there are two important concept defining words one is induction and underlying molecules called inducers and then we have something called competence okay like for example i can teach you developmental biology but unless otherwise you already know high school level education you are not going to be able to follow so you have to be competent to be able to induce so that is what is competence here so that's why that is specifically defined as um, separate thing so we are going to learn this using uh, eye development in vertebrates as the example okay so that's where there seems to be a lot of um, you know th those uh, st steps that we want to consider they are all there in that process and that's why that is an example in the book so these are directly from the book by the way so what is an inducer so it its inducer is a molecule produced by the cells that induce some other cells to adopt a certain fate okay so that they are the inducers and that process of for, for example you know without having a certain say neighboring cell a given cell may not differentiate in a certain way so those neighboring cells are the inducers molecules produced by those cells and this cell will not be able to listen to those inducers unless otherwise this has the competence for, for example has the receptor for those signals coming from the neighboring cells so that is called competence so it, it is just to illustrate that competence is not like a passive like any cell cannot may not be in, induced to form a particular structure purely based on the instruction coming from the inducer the compete uh, the receiving cell must have the competence okay so that is the two definitions so if you look at this uh, schematic so this is a cross section of the early embryonic um, stage where we are focusing on the um, eye development okay P part of the ectoderm and mesoderm where you have the eye development happening okay so this is like the head part of the ectoderm so this will be the you know the trunk and other rest of the part so this is the head part so the this top portion so that head ectoderm or the anterior ectoderm okay uh, only has the competence to make the lens for example this is taking shape to make the lens eventually okay this part and this this is not going to form anywhere in the anterior ectoderm okay in this entire place only where you have this optic vesicle okay uh, that is underlying this uh, surface ectoderm only if there is optic vesicle that and in in adjacent ectoderm you have the lens development happening meaning this anterior ectoderm has the competence to respond to an inductive signal coming from the optic vesicle and the optic vesicle is the inducer okay this can be experimentally tested for example you take this optic vesicle put it here uh, to a, at a lower ectoderm and that is not going to induce lens formation there similarly if you do not have like for example in this part if you do not have the underlying optic vesicle this ectoderm is not going to form lens and instead if you put some other tissue that is not going to be able to induce this okay so induction competence work together in tandem it's fairly straightforward right it's it's not that hard for us to get this so he, here is an example like for example pac6 expression in the anterior ectoderm makes it competent okay making the anterior ectoderm competent so if you don't have pac6 expressed as seen in uh, b um, so you do not make the eye socket itself so you do, the lens pit does not form in addition you have other defects are therefore that um, you know mouse ends up not forming the head itself right so this is the place where eye would develop and that is completely absent in this pac 6 knockout 
okay. So, PAC 6 is something we already know, right. It is uh, it is a transcription factor and its expression is controlled by multiple modular enhancers, right. So, this can be tested uh, more thoroughly uh, as shown in this experiment. So, here you have optic vesicles wild type meaning PAC 6 is intact in that. So, you do not worry whether it is expressed there or not while doing this experiment. Surface ectoderm wild type. So, you make the lens forming okay, in that. Now, you have optic vesicles uh, that is the inducer yeah, okay, going by our this experiment okay, optic vesicle is the inducer and uh, that is homozygous for loss of PAX X activity. Surface ectoderm is on the other hand wild type. So, these are recombination experiments you know, as titled here and you have lens forming indicating that the responding tissue uh, has its competence probably by expressing PAX 6 it need not be there in the inducer. And then you do the opposite then you realize it does not work which is consistent and reinforcing the this finding right. If you have wild type inducer but mutant responder then it does not work. So, it, now this optic vesicle has no competency to respond to the inducing signal coming from the other one. And if of course, both are mutant it is not going to develop. So, this is how you establish competence factors. Yeah, here you are taking tissue like for example, you are taking surface ectoderm from one genotype and the optic vesicle from another genotype and putting them together. So, these are the skill uh, skills one would learn if you studied in a department with developmental biologists working with frog, mouse, chick etcetera. So, if not you are not going to get into those mostly you get into molecular experiments. But uh, so, I talked to quite a few people because I used to be fascinated about doing this and I wanted to do and when I talked to people they said oh do not worry anytime you want you come to our lab we will teach you and these are fairly straightforward. So, from that I am gathering these are not that difficult these transplantation experiments are not that difficult people readily do it. Then we are moving further into the rules that govern induction and competence. So, the, the main point here is the inducer does not remain inducer forever responder does not rem remain competent for that inductive signal all the time. So, these are dynamic and inducer might become a responder and the responding one might become inducer ok. One and second the, these are at, uh, temporally regulated at different points different things induce. So, uh, the Gilbert book uses the analogy of um, in a in a football match the one who kicks the you know the goal kicks the ball for the goal. Uh, so, you think he is the or she is the only one who is responsible for winning no there are so many people who are kicking such that the ball reached this person right. So, that happens in this process too for example, in this case this head ectoderm to be able to become competent to receive signal from optic vesicles there were earlier inductive events ok. At different points different things have induced it to reach a point where it could become competent and that is what we are going to see in the next two or three slides. So, this graph sort of um, shows you that here this is the relative capacity to induce the um, uh, you know induced to make the uh, finally the lens and these are the different stages at different stages different tissues. For example, gastrula to neurula you have the endoderm tissue inducing this ectoderm and its activity starts here and ends here it peaks somewhere uh, you know at the middle of neurula and then sequentially next it is cardiac mesoderm stone then finally, optic vesicle. So, if these two did not induce sequentially before that head ectoderm now will not be competent to respond to optic vesicle signal ok. So, that is what is illustrated in this. Um, so, the, the point is sequential induction ok and that we will see picked uh, you know in a schematic in the next uh, two slides. 
So, this is showing a cross section kind of a drawing of the head ectoderm. So, you have this um, you know four gut ectoderm meaning in the gut this is going to form the upper part later this endoderm layer and that one induces uh, this uh, where the presumptive lens is going to form that ectoderm initially it induces. So, we still do not know the signal that is responsible for it, but uh, this tissue seems to be responsible for it. And in turn the adjacent um, ectoderm which later forms the you know retina that gets induced by the dorsal mesoderm as well as that seem to induce the endoderm as well. And that induction these things lead to expression of this transcription factor. Uh, eventually in this part of the ectoderm that is going to form the lens. Okay. So, that is how the this uh, new transcription factor starts appearing there. So, there are sequential events and there are additive we will see the additive in a second. So, the first OTX 2 comes and that alone is not going to make the lens. Then you have further signaling from this adjacent ectoderm which will eventually form the retina. They are going to induce in these cells and then mesoderm signals as well to start expressing PAC6. And only after getting PAC6 it is going to be competent to receive optic vesicle signal. And at later stage when the optic vesicle signal comes which people believe is a BMP you know bone morphogenetic factor. Um, so, that signaling pathway we will probably get to today we, we should have time for that. So, that induces um, in a SOX3 expression here. So, now you have multiple transcription factors activated here and all of them together only lead to the formation of lens, um, lens placard finally in that place. So, you have sequential and then additive of multiple inducers. So, here sequential because initially the endoderm then mesoderm then the adjacent uh, ectoderm then finally the optic vesicle. So, in that sequence they all activated and all their activity bec becomes additive and uh, finally you have a particular tissue getting specified there. So, this is uh, this is a common theme this is found in all other uh, organ development too. So, this is one well characterized example where the sequential additive all those exist. So, therefore, we are using this as an example. Oh, yeah. So, right, the first endoderm, okay, the foregut endoderm, the upper part of the top part of the ectoderm, sorry, endoderm induces this um, head ectoderm initially, and that induction is necessary for it to be able to respond later. Okay. So, the events that happen here uh, is essential and you also have mesoderm activating signals here and that probably leads to the next step where this is able to induce OTX2 production here. So, these arrows whatever these arrows those signals we still do not know, but those tissues have been found to be responsible in experiments of this nature. So, purely based on tissue transplantation sort of recombination experiments people know that these arrows are true, but what are the underlying molecules that we do not know. So, the one molecule that they finally find is that this um, you know this adjacent ectoderm induces OTX2 expression here. So, that is the sequence. The next one is uh, PAC6 expression. So, yeah, so this see th this is differentiating as well. So, now you get neural plate the remember the N category in expressing and E category in alone expressing epidermis one becomes epidermis another one becomes the neural cells the, they, they contribute to the neural plate and they are going to imaginate. So, those, dif those differentiation happen too and those neural cells are the ones that finally induce this. Okay, so, that that theme is coming clearer in the next couple of slides and then that leads to the production of PAC6 and when the optic vesicle finally induces you get the SOX3. 
So, here they think that the signal is BMP4. So, these inductions happen in a cascade and in a reciprocal manner as well. So, the reciprocal is the main new thing that is coming from this slide and the next one. So, the, the point simply is an inducer becomes competent in the next step. So, at one point like for example, here uh, the optic vesicle initially induces the um, uh, head ectoderm to form the lens placard. At a later step, this developing lens induces the op uh, optic vesicle to make an optic cup. So, this happens and then they differentiate into two kinds of cells. One is going to be the neural part of the retina and the other one is going to be the pigmented part of retina. So, that differentiation is induced by this developing lens. So, the, in, the competing the responding one now has become an inducer and the inducer has become the responding. Okay, so, that is what is reciprocal clear right and these go in a sequential order. So, it is all summarized in a graph in the next slide. So, but we will slowly go through the steps. Okay. So, here the lens vesicle that formed uh, further uh, induces this to make you know this optic stock and primarily the differentiation of these uh, neural retinal cells and the pigmented ones. So, these are the ones that are going to have the rods and cones. So, these are the ones that are going to convert uh, light signal into electrical signal which is going to go through this to the visual cortex in the brain. Okay. This does not stop only in this direction, it induces this uh, overlying ectoderm to form cornea. So, these cells become column or see that uh, the tissue shape changes then cell shape is also going to change, but that is not shown here to make the cornea. So, the outer cover over your eye okay, transparent outer cover. Um, so, and so on. So, it go it, it sort of goes in this fashion okay. one induces the other one to become uh, take a particular uh, you know fate and then that in turn induces the original inducer as well as an additional tissue and this is the summary of all of it. So, this we will go slowly. So, you have early gastrula, late gastrula, early neurula meaning where the neural fold and neural tube formation takes place and then mid to late neurula. So, initially you have the prospective ectoderm and that gets induced initially by the mesoderm uh, to make this neural plate and prospective epidermis this is the n category in expressing one and then this one as well as the forget endoderm and then the mesoderm dorsal mesoderm that is finally going to form the heart they induce this to make the lens ectoderm and this is going to now differentiate into optic cup and this in turn gets induced by this mesoderm here which we did not see so far in our uh, cartoons and uh, this optic vesicle induces this uh, tissue this is what we were mostly looking at at the very first one to make the lens placard which induces this to make the optic cup. Okay. And this now becomes the lens vesicle which induces this as well as this to you know this surface this one to make the cornea and the other one to become uh, differentiate into pigmented retina and neural retina and this eventually becomes the lens. So, all of this happen you, you see reciprocal you know one in this direction the next in this direction and here again this. So, you have reciprocal and sequential. So, that is how the tissues finally take shape. So, here one main point that we should not miss is um, at every stage of development these are functional as something or the other. So, you are trying to make a lens and it is going to finally function as a lens in the fully developed um, organism, but during the course it is doing other jobs like here it is functioning this lens sorry this lens vesicle is functioning as an inducer for the optic cup 
to differentiate into these two cell types ok and that is true at every step. So, these developing intermediate transient states themselves are specific functional tissues uh, without that the whole development is not put together. So, that is something you should not miss ok. Okay, so, this is sort of summary, this is like very straightforward you know only the B part you have not heard. The A part, th this is what we have learnt by going through all these cartoons so far. In the presence of tissue A, responding tissue B develops in a certain way, okay. When optic vesicle is underlying, the anterior ectoderm forms a lens placard, okay. In the absence of tissue A, the responding tissue B does not develop that way, it does not make the you know the lens. And in the absence of A, but in the presence of B sorry C, B does not develop that way, ok. It is not going to, it, it needs that specific inducing signal. So, these are the general principles of uh, instructive interaction. So, the induct inducer instructs what to do, there again you are going to see some really funny things happening. So, we will get to that later. The other one E C one is the permissive interaction, some of the cells know exactly what they want to do, it is just that they have to be in the nice environment, if not they are not going to do. For example, they have to have a substratum on which they can anchor themselves, if that is there then they will develop like fibronectin etcetera the ECM, if it is there that cell is going to develop on its own, it does not need induction and those kind of things are called permissive interaction. A, a good uh, example is you know the in tissue culture plates where adherent cells need the adherence otherwise they do not uh, grow the way they normally grow. Okay. So, the next uh, step that we are moving forward in this induction is um, two different specificities we are going to see, one is called a regional specificity, another one is called a genetic specificity. So, we will get to them and before that all, almost all organs have these two cell types epithelial and mesenchymal and this epithelial mesenchymal interaction is very critical for most of the development. So, this uh, the feather development in chick is one good uh, uh, example. So, here you have rows of this primordia from which feathers are going to come and if you look at it, they are in between the adjacent rows ok. So, like you take one of them and then you will see in the adjacent one there is a gap on both sides, so they alternate. And uh, if you do in situ for a signaling molecule, we are going to learn about signaling molecules in detail. Uh, here it is um, for uh, sonic hedgehog, uh, hedgehog is a signaling molecule that we will learn and its expression is exactly in those primordia ok. So, that is where the specification is taking place. So, this is being done by the mesoderm that is underlying this epidermis ok. So, if you cut open and see the mesoderm and that is responsible for it and we will see how that mesoderm is going to pattern the skin in different parts of the body differently ok. So, that is where regional specificity comes. So, the, the induction response between these two is very critical ok. So, that is the main point I want to say here yeah. So, here you are taking epiderm uh, a constant epiderm from one part of the skin you took the epiderm ok the surface epidermis. Now, you are going to keep this adjacent to mesenchyme that you took from different parts of the body ok. Like for example, I, I took the epidermis from this region, now I am going to keep it adjacent to mesoderm from this part or mesoderm from here or mesoderm from the end of the leg. From different parts I am going to take the mesoderm and keep adjacent to the epidermis taken from here. Now, let us see what they develop into. So, when you have the wing one that makes this nice feather and if it is from the thigh region it is going to make this thigh feather ok and if it is from the foot it is going to make the claw. The same surface epidermis produces different structures based on who is instructing it ok. So, this is what they call as regional specificity 
different regions of the mesoderm already has different um, inducing ability on the epidermis. And if you take this uh, you know thought process a little further, you can make funny structures like this. Here you are not transplanting within the same species in the previous one pretty much from the same individual. Here you are going to do cross species experiment. Okay. So, this is a salamander called newt, this is a frog, okay. both are amphibians. So, they are very closely related species. So, you are taking from frog at gastrula stage and transplanting to the presumptive oral ectoderm part of newt, the salamander. Okay. Now, what it is going to do is it is going to the underlying mesoderm. So, here actually you are you know cross species recombination of mesoderm ectoderm right. So, here the underlying mesoderm is from newt, but the ectoderm is from frog. So, this mesoderm tells okay, go ahead and make the oral part, uh, but this epidermis knows only to make the oral part of a frog and it makes that the succus of the tadpole frog tadpole and you do the reverse experiment and the frog mesoderm uh, at the you know the, the region where it would normally le lead to the oral structures to form this mesoderm tells go and make the oral stuff but this ectoderm knows only to make these balancers so you have frog tadpoles with new balancers so this tells you the genetic specificity so this epidermis knows to listen to the instruction from a uh, mesoderm, but it has its geni uh, genetic constellation is such that it only can induce to make these structures and not these structures, okay. because it has already undergone earlier instructions and already there is differential gene expression that has kicked in that is only waiting for the go ahead signal. The go ahead signal comes and it knows to make balancer and it goes and makes the balancer right and uh, that is what happens is not this cool. Okay, so, here is an interesting experiment. So, now who are these inducers in what shape they come and uh, how far they can go do they need to be adjacent all those things are the questions we are going to deal with next. So, here is an ex uh, experiment where the neural retina and the lens are, are separated with a filter paper there. So, now as long as the filter paper is porous whatever the inducer that comes from here that seem to uh, induce this ectoderm to form the lens indicating that this is producing molecules that can diffuse some distance diffuse through uh, a filter paper. But when they put a barrier like absolutely non impermeable one and that did not happen. Okay. So, these sort of experiments finally led to these understandings shown here. So, some signals require cell cell contact a good example is the primary fate in vulva. Okay. Inducing the two adjacent ones to become secondary that is requiring this kind of a signaling that is called uh, lateral signaling among equivalent group cells otherwise they are equally potent uh, in, in terms of the development. So, this is called a juxtacrine signaling where the cells have to be in physical contact like one cell membrane should be in touch with the adjacent cell membrane the inducer and the responder. And there is another situation where the molecules produced by the inducer can diffuse in the vicinity and the distance the diffuses varies significantly, but not as far as what the endocrine signaling will do. And these are called paracrine signaling. So, most of the cell cell signaling involved in development are of this nature. And this, uh, there is only one signaling that we know that is of this nature and that is very critical in many situations. So, this is paracrine signaling okay. and then you have uh, a situation where um, the paracrine signal is actually ECM the extracellular matrix produces the signal. Okay. 
So, now uh, in the next uh, few minutes as well as in the next class, maybe even another class, we will be uh, discussing these paracrine and juxtacrine signaling, okay, the different cell, um, cell signaling mechanisms. So, even before we get into a summary like uh, a stereotype of all kinds of signaling, uh, one important point that we need to think about uh, is this. To make all the complex tissues that our body has, you are not having that many varieties of tools. Okay? It is pretty much uh, the way you use a screwdriver and wrench. Right? So, you using a screwdriver you can put together many things or um, you know dismantle many different things. You can use a screwdriver in a plane, you can use a screwdriver in your bicycle. Right? That is the kind of logic na nature has played around. The toolkit it used to make vulva in nematode 700 million years ago is the same toolkit it uses uh, to make uh, vertebrate structures, okay? like for example, to induce bone formation or to induce cell proliferation, it uses the same toolkit. And many of these toolkits were originally identified through genetic experiments focused on Drosophila embryo development. Okay. So, this is the an important thing we need to remember. It is we do not have like uh, uh, 100,000 signaling pathways to memorize, we have only 4, just 4. Okay. Imagine with 4 different cell signaling, you are able to make all the organs. Okay, using simple rules. Um, so, we basically need to learn these four types, you know what each one is, the individual nuts and bolts of them and in which development they are involved. So, that is what we are going to learn about all the four. There are some variations in the theme like the fibroblast growth factor FGF based one has based on the ligands it differs and then based on transducer also there is a small difference. Um, and the one that is not listed here is the juxta crime. Um, so, that we will learn when we get to that. So, before we go to the details, this is a, a generalized scheme that underlies all the four varieties. So, essentially you have a receptor, a transmembrane protein having a cytoplasmic domain as well as extracellular domain. Then the molecule, the inducer from the inducing tissue comes and binds that leads to conformation changes in the receptor molecule and that conformation uh, you know transmitted into the cytoplasmic region. Uh, for example, in this case leads to a phosphorylation of the receptor itself. There is a latent kinase activity that gets activated through this uh, confirmation change induced by the ligand such that this phosphorylates itself. And this phosphorylated version is an active kinase that phosphorylates uh, intracellular molecules then the cascade goes on. Okay. Um, in many cases it uh, finally goes into nucleus to activate or inhibit or modulate otherwise transcription of downstream genes. Okay. So, that is how it works. So, here for example, there is a dimerization also the two polypeptides come together. So, that is the general feature. So, now we will get into the first one which is called RTK receptor tyrosine kinase pathway or based on the ligands fibroblast growth factor or FGF and in vertebrates there are multiples. So, that is why you have FGF 1, 2, 4, 7, 8. We have encountered FGF earlier. So, these are required for uh, limb development and the lens development. So, that is the example we are going to look at right here. So, this is an um, in situ hybridization whole mount embryonic uh, embryo in, in situ hybridization of mouse embryo. So, it just shows you where it is expressed for this like limb primordium. So, the hind limb, fore limb, tail, okay, the lens where it is going to form pharyngeal arch, somites along the vertebral and then between the two brain like mid brain, hind brain. So, these are the places where it is expressed and that is where its function is important. Okay. 
and since we were uh, talking about optic vesicle and the lens, so that example is shown here uh, in an experimental way. So, this is uh, the MAF transcription factor you remember we learnt when we are talking about combinatorial activation uh, action of transcription factors. So, that MAF induction is used as a marker here for lens development. So, uh, whether you have optic vesicle uh, here um, or you have just the FGF 8 coated bead either one of the two the lens uh, forming ectoderm starts expressing MAF. So, the MAF is what is this blue color. So, showing that the FGF 8 is actually the molecule produced by the optic vesicle to induce the lens. Okay. So, this is how we are moving from cell type to the molecules. So, the pathway looks like this. Okay, we are already familiar with this, we have learned LED 60, right. Let 60 is a RAS. So, this pathway for example, in C elegans induces vulva development. In Drosophila, it is required for that compound eye development. In human for cell proliferation. So, essentially by controlling the amount of proliferation, uh, in the previous example, we saw the follicle development or uh, the leg length. Okay. So, if you make enough of cells before differentiation, then you make a longer leg and if you prematurely activate differentiation with a smaller amount of cells, then you are going to make a shorter one. So, that is how the regulation of this pathway happens uh, in when we talk about proliferation. So, what are the nuts and bolts of this pathway? So, we know how this would have been found, right? How this we know this ligand to transcription factor it is in this order? Epistasis, right? Okay. So, no differential screening, subtractive hybridization or NGS or um, what not, pure genetic experiments with no understanding of the molecule is how we know molecules work in this order. So, you have a ligand that binds uh, usually the ligand may be FGF or stem cell factor and there are many varieties of ligands bind to this pathway. So, we will see one example of that later probably in the next class. And when the ligand binds, the this uh, these two dimerize and as well as they get phosphorylated, like they phosphorylate themselves, a latent protein kinase activity gets activated. And they phosphorylate tyrosine residues, and that is why it is a receptor tyrosine kinase. It is a receptor that is a tyrosine kinase when activated. And that activated version binds to an adapter protein. Okay. So, what this adapter protein does in this uh, cytoplasm is it is going to activate a protein attached to it, it called the guanylate, guanylate nucleotide releasing protein. What where this uh, it releases this guanylate nucleotide is from RAS protein. Okay, this RAS is what let 60 we learnt in vulva development. So, this normally has a GDP version bound to it and this GNRP would release that and as a result this RAS will bind a GTP and the GTP bound RAS is active version. So, this is how this signal is transduced into the cytoplasm and this RAS in this pathway here is going to activate RAF that is going to phosphorylate something called uh, MEC which is a MAP kinase activating kinase and that is going to phosphorylate another kinase called ERK. So, ERK is the MPK1 in C elegans, let 60 equivalent for RAS. In C elegans, ERK is MPK1. And uh, this is extracellular signal regulated kinase, that is what is ERK stands for. And this is now going to get into the nucleus. Without that phosphorylation, it is not going to go in. It goes in and then it uh, um, binds to transcription factor which is inactive and now that becomes active and that is going to modulate the transcription of downstream targets. Okay. So, the starting point is ligand binding to RTK, the end is ERK getting phosphorylated and translocating into the nucleus. So, this is the active part. But 
once a ligand binds and this happens, now is this going to be continuing? No, it works more like the way you regulate automobiles. So, what do you do? Like, like for example, when we wanted this light to be on, we turn on a switch and it is on continuously, I am not holding the switch anymore. But why do not do, I do that with the car? Get into the car and start the engine keeps running continuously and the car keeps moving. So, that regulation is not enough there, you need a far more fine control. So, there you have an accelerator pedal only as long as you keep pressing the petrol will go or diesel will go or gasoline will go and the engine will run. Okay. The moment you relax a little bit your uh, foot, the accelerator will stop. Right? That is the kind of regulation that happens in this pathway. So, whenever you need such fine tight control that is required and that accelerator is this RAS. So, the RAS has an intrinsic GTP hydrolysis activity and that gets activated by a protein called GAP. Remember our GAP 3, okay, that is a GAP. So, GAP 3 is a gap in C. elegans germline. So, this gap what it does is it stimulates the latent GTP hydrolysis activity of RAS. So, the GTP gets hydrolyzed and becomes GDP. So, it does not remain like this, instead it quickly becomes this. So, it is continuously becoming inactive. So, only as long as the signaling happens, this will be there. The moment you stop this, then this gets frozen here. So, only if you keep pressing the pedal accelerator, diesel goes to the engine. The moment you take, diesel stops, unlike the switch for your electric light. And you understand the context, okay. You know, if the light is on and uh, uh, it is convenient that it is on and I do not need to be holding the switch. But on the other hand, in car, you do not want it to be an automatic function. What if you fall asleep, okay. Um, so, you are something happens, you get a heart attack, what happens? The car must stall right away and that is why there you have a negative control of that kind. So, that is what this gap protein binds. The gap protein gets activated by the way with by this itself. So, the signaling activates both and that is why there is a fine control at the level of RAS. So, almost all small these RAS belongs to a group of molecules that we already learnt small GTPases. What is the small GTPase we learnt last? Rho. So, this is another GTPase. So, Rho is involved in actin cytoskeleton rearrangement, but uh, uh, RAS participate in this pathway. But otherwise they are coming from a common ancestor, small GTPases. Okay, I will stop here and further signaling pathways next class. <laughs>